Welcome to episode 305 of Grid Talks. Today we're here to review the 2023 British Grand Prix. My name is Ruby Price and joining me we have Aaron Harper from AHGP. Good afternoon. Warren Shaw from Paddock Pals. Hello. And from Grip Strip Podcast, Philip Matthew. Hello. Before we get into the episode, we must thank our sponsor for this episode, Bet Online. Bet Online is your number one source for all your betting needs. Get the latest odds, lines, and matchup reports for baseball, boxing, golf, and more. Bet Online continues to be the fastest and easiest way to place your wages, including live betting and your favorite casino and card games available to play right from your phone. Head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today and get in on the action. Remember to use our promo code Believe B L E A V for your fifty percent welcome and bonus on your first deposit bet online where the game starts but first if you enjoy this podcast we would love it if you could take five to leave us a five star rating on spotify or a five star review on apple podcasts and if you're one of the 70 odd percent of people who aren't yet subscribed to our youtube channel please consider helping us out with a like and a subscribe and be sure to follow us on our brand new social channels at grid talk uk to stay up to date with the show so silverstone always produces a spectacle and despite yet another max verstappen win we certainly saw spectacle today with Lando Norris and Lewis Hamilton home heroes charging through to give the British fans a podium to cheer about there was the threat of rain but the team for whom it poured Alpine Esteban Ocon after his 30 second post race penalty for driving a completely different track layout in Austria last weekend didn't even make it to lap 10 and had to retire the car with a hydraulic leak and Pierre Gasly retiring on lap 46 after a collision with Stroll. A double DNF Aaron for the Alpine team, not what they would have wanted today. Well, I think they found the solution to Esteban Ocon's uh, extending track limits uh, habit is to just not let him race too much. Too much. Um, no, just bring the car in after a handful of laps. Don't allow him time to clock up those penalties. I say that all in jest. It was obviously not very good for Alpine that Ocon was being pulled into the pit lane in the early laps, especially because the McLarens, who were only a few points behind them in the championship standings and in the constructors, were at the, that point first and third, or that or maybe by that point second and third. So on course for a very strong result. And then for Gasly to be unceremoniously bashed out of the points by Lance Stroll, just rubbing insult to injury, isn't it? Because Alpine have shone at times this season, but all of a sudden, in the face of McLaren suddenly getting their act together and looking like prime McLaren of the the eighties and the mid the, the late nineties and you know parts of the two thousands, they're suddenly looking a little bit ropey with their car, which seemed to be going along all right. But reliability, lack of pace now. Not looking great for them, and they could very quickly, if they haven't already, I haven't looked at the championship standings, I'm assuming McLaren's result has taken them beyond Alpine, um, but they could very quickly find themselves uh, a long way behind McLaren in that battle. And McLaren could potentially, if they put a string of results together, catch one of the other teams ahead of them. It'd be a big ask, but you know, Alpine need to be making sure they're getting onto the coattails of McLaren and bringing upgrades to that car. Yeah, I was saying in the, I think the Austrian preview that Alpine were kind of in no man's land with McLaren much further behind them, similarly in no man's land based on the retrospective points. But now after today's result, McLaren P5 in the championship with 59 points, Alpine P6 with 47 points. But Warren, looking at the Haas then of Kevin Magnussen, it's another power unit related retirement in two days for the Danish driver. Ended up bringing the safety car out and his teammate Nico Hulkenberg had to box very early for a new front wing after contact with Perez. An incident filled day for Haas. Yeah. I th- obviously another forgetful day for them. They just have shown in the race that they just don't have any pace at all. The last four or five races, they're pretty solid in uh, qualifying or one of the cars is pretty good in qualifying. Whoever that may be one time, it seems to be Magnuson, but mostly lately it seemed to be Hulkenberg. I really just don't, I mean, what is going on? Like they just seem like they're an irrelevant team. Like I hate to say it, but at least like, Williams is showing some progress. I mean, Alpha Tower is really not showing any progress. And Haas is just 
they're just kind of stuck in the mud doing doing nothing. I, the best thing they did today was have uh, Magnuson's car catch on fire so it could bring out a safety car and kind of light a fire in the race. Like that was the thing that got it, it got it spicy at the end. So credit for that and the Ferrari power unit um, just going out. But I, yeah, not a good day for Haas at all. The season has been a terrible season for them in general. It's to me, it's it's quite surprising. I thought that they that they would maybe take a little step forward, but they just seem to like they got nothing. I they like they have they have nothing. You would think that well, the whole point of them bringing in Hulkenberg over Schumacher was, hey, we need a more consistent driver. This and, and I know it's not all the driver. The car is not very good. But what was the point of bringing in Hulkenberg if you're not going to be consistently getting 9th, 10th, and 11th? Schumacher could be totally doing what Hulkenberg is doing right now. That's this, it just what they did last year for this year. It's not working out, obviously, to plan. Yeah, absolutely. And the Haas now being P8 with 11 points. Aaron, I, have you got anything else to add here? I was just going to raise the question is uh, Haas's Ferrari link? starting to hold them back because we've seen Ferrari change their philosophy in terms of the design of the car. And the Haas is very, very similar in its technical detail to the Ferrari, the shaping of the side pods. I know they're not the be all and end all, but they're very influential in the way that it channels the airflow, but their the connection with Ferrari, are they now too close? And that's what's holding them back there. They're struggling with similar sort of things like the, the tire wear and, and certain things are the, the power unit, of course, blowing up every now and again. So do you reckon that's holding them back? That's sort of a point to everybody. I mean, certainly something um, that is a good link and I'd certainly say something maybe to discuss in the post show. But there yeah. is definitely um, like definitely a link to that Ferrari that is causing um, problems for Haas and to be honest has probably been one of the reasons for you know their downfall over all of those um, seasons that they've been so closely linked with the Ferrari team but Phil just looking at the Alpha Tauris um, did not have the best of qualifying sessions yesterday they've not really been able to make any progress on track today um, Sonoda was passed by Joe on the penultimate lap. I don't even recall seeing DeVries on the broadcast. And they're the last of the finishers. Uh, a quiet weekend for them. Yeah, it's uh, unfortunate for Alpha Tori, but I think it's kind of par for the course. Uh, I was on the the preview show, and I think I had Alpha Tori then too and didn't really have very high hopes for them, and it came through. When you have all these other teams that are developing and uh, Williams as a as one example, you have McLaren with this huge uh, progression uh, that um, those are two examples that, you know, while they're moving forward, uh, you have Haas and now you have, um, you know, Alpha Tori who's basically been in been in the uh, in the weeds for a couple of years now. Um, they're trying to make the changes. There might be more Red Bull influence in the team, but what is that really going to mean? Are they going to make one car work and the other one's going to be God awful? Does it mean that their engines are going to start blowing up? Like, what does that really mean? Um, it's unfortunate for Yuki he got past there at the end. Joe, of course, being able to actually finish the British Grand Prix this year because he only made it one corner. Thankfully got out of his car last year. Um, but yeah, it's just pretty, uh, pretty, pretty bad for them and, uh, doubt that there's much in the way of, uh, uh, solace coming their way here with the rest of the, this prior to the break and even after. Yeah, absolutely. And with Alpha Tauri now being seven points behind, um, the Alfa Romeo team, like just absolutely stuck at the back and you f you struggle to see a point where this team is going to make up you know points to bring themselves off the bottom it's very much a has of 2021 like kind of scenario what i don't see it happening um what do you think let us uh know in the comments and down on our socials but just ahead of them then aaron um another team who 
are having mixed bags of results. Alfa Romeo finishing P15 with Joe, uh, P12 with Valtteri Bottas. He started from the back. Joe was suffering with brake issues. Was this the best result the Alphas could have achieved today? Yeah, pretty much, because they 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 didn't show pace at all through the weekend. It's just Alfa Romeo are such a weird team to sort of get a hold of and work out where they're going. They're kind of in limbo because the Alfa Romeo thing isn't, and it was nothing more than a sponsorship. And they're still a few years out from becoming Audi and getting the the sort of works sort of status with the, the engine or the power unit and and all the money that comes with that, the branding and everything like that. So where they end up by the point Audi actually come in in 2026 and take over is very interesting. And Bottas, he he does fluctuate, but today I think he he drove a good race, quiet race, didn't really see that much of him. And and Joe as well. I was watching the Channel 4 coverage and Alex Jakes said Joe Guanyu would be hoping for a much quieter British Grand Prix. And he, he got a very quiet one in the fact that we barely noticed him. So that, you know, you can you can take the tongue in cheek joke there. That's that's fine. So, yeah, they just didn't have the car for this circuit. It's, it's as simple as that. And they were beaten by both Williamses. And that is as much a bit of an indictment of the job that Alfa Romeo are doing by not developing their car sufficiently from the good position they had at the start of last year to, you know, it's credit to Williams for doing a great job with their car this year. And, you know, Logan Sargent and Alex Albon getting the most out of it. So for Alfa, they've got to make the most of the days when they are good. And those good days are becoming increasingly fewer and further between so they'll be hoping that Hungary does them some good maybe Spa with the Ferrari power unit which is quite good perhaps Monza in a few races time but you know you're you're clutching at straws if you're an Alfa Romeo fan yeah and with that Ferrari power unit they certainly have to keep their fingers crossed that it doesn't just go up in flames mid-race but Warren, um, a five-second penalty for Lance Stroll after going off and causing the retirement of Pierre Gasly. Tell me about his race today because there were some questionable moments. And even from the stewards, we saw him get no further action for passing Gasly. at I think it was Stowe, despite getting a black and white flag for track limit infringements at that corner at the same time. What was going on? I don't know. That was quite interesting, right? Isn't it so you get flagged for the black and white flag and then you don't for and then you don't get have to give the position back? Doesn't make any like they made two different rules at the same time, but or they applied something without applying the action that should have happened for it. I don't know. That was very confusing. And also on the broadcast, it kind of seemed like they talked about it for a second. I know there's more important things, but then just like went right past it, at least on Sky. I was like, shouldn't we be talking about this a lot more of how they did this action? And then they said, no, this is still fine. Like, I mean, if I was Gasly, absolutely furious with that, giving it back. And then, lo and behold, three laps later, he just, or however many laps later, just yeets him off the track and into the into the pit lane and says, see ya. That probably looked like, I know I haven't played F1 2023 with you guys yet, but that's probably some action. That's an, that's a video game move is what I call it. Just use the car to get past you. And that's exactly what he did. And just ended the race a five second penalty, deservedly so. Um, so credit to Stroll for, for getting at least some, look, he's like, I hate to say it. he's kind of like the common man driver out there. I know he's he's in it because his dad, but I still I've been a defendant of Lansing. I think he's kind of talented with the Aston Martin and him being so far off Alonzo. I think I need to re reassess my position on Stroll. He's he's making it hard to defend as an nepotism guy, but he look he does bring a lot of comedy to the track, which I don't know really what you're looking for in an F1 in an F1 driver, but he does, and he did that again today. I know you're laughing at him, but he he brings a lot of comedy out there. I think he's he's a funny he's a funny driver to watch. Yeah, as a former, he's a funny guy. as a fellow former defender of Lance Stroll, you know when he was you know at least learning, put some good performances in in that Williams. Went obviously yeah. over to Force India Racing Point and you know put in some good performances, but he was clearly not the better driver of the team. But just with how far back he's consistently been 
in that Aston Martin. He has beaten Fernando Alonso, though, on several occasions this season. So there is that to consider. But yeah, um, disappointing from Lance, disappointing in terms of consistency from the stewards. Um, but excitingly, Phil, uh, just on the verge of the top 10, Logan Sargent promoted up to P11 after Stroll's penalty and so close to double points for Williams. Uh, Alex Albon made some great moves on both the Ferraris and managed to claim eighth place. Is this Williams finally coming into its element? I think it was a product of the, you know, there are upgrades and with James Vowles actually coming through and helping bring this team into the 21st century add the fact that they're at silverstone it's race 799 uh should have been 800 but it was a perfect storm uh the way that their car is and everything is going ruby i mean it, it's great to see personally um being a guy who's rooted for williams in the past and have a obvious um bias now for one of the drivers but i actually am a fan of alex albon because i support anybody who's gotten run over <laughs> by red bull um but you know it, it's the for him the way he's been race driving here recently it it really shows that they're making big strides and it's a great thing to see for that organization and um i mean for albon too the way he is competition. And then I think they really, if they had managed uh, Logan's qualifying a little better, I think he could have gotten into uh, Q3 maybe. I'm not, I mean, it's a stretch. I get it, but he's never, he only has made a second Q2, but even with that, that got sketchy. Um, so if they would manage his qualifying a little better, he could be up there. Uh, not to the level of Albon because of his experience, but on these type of longer tracks, bigger straightaways, the double points could start coming for uh, Williams, which would be huge for them in the Constructors' Championship, moving themselves out of the doldrums that they've been in for the last few years. Absolutely. And speaking of the points, like sort of moving them out of the doldrums, their four points today that Alex Albon brought home has pushed them up to P7, uh, just ahead of Haas, but tied on 11 points. Um, the sort of news and like momentum that Williams have needed almost after, you know, teasing that they could have some speed last season. This season, we are seeing it being a lot more consistently with Alex Albon. We just need to see Sargent deliver um but as to whether that that continues with tracks like hungary coming up who knows what's going to happen but aaron do you know any good strategists because uh, or strategists in fact um because ferrari need all the help they can get um it was status four till the end for carlos Sainz, who stayed out on his hard tires under the safety car leclerc ditched his hard tires for the medium so clearly someone in that camp knew it was the right decision to change from the hards at the end um but the pair struggled to stay in the top 10 carlos Sainz losing out big time not very vamos uh yeah it was just <laughs> it was ferrari all over wasn't it where where do you start they were going all right early on obviously science lost the place to russell on the softs at the start and that's probably to be expected um then they got scared by the pace of the softs i think and worried about the undercut they didn't trust their strategy and the fact that eventually the softs would peter out and the mediums would still give that pace um, or they were chewing through the tyre too much, which is a problem they've had this season um, before. And then from there, it just unravelled, didn't it? it? Carlos Sainz comically <laughs> forgot what plan B was. <laughs> they've got so many letters. <laughs> I'm sorry, this isn't professional to laugh about it, is it? But it was. Even the commentary teams were giggling about it. And... You know, you've got the drivers forgetting which plan is which. And then to put them both on the hard compound tyre to run to the end, even not to split your strategy, like run one, one hard and then have one run mediums longer and go softs at the end. But to double down on the hard tyre option must have been because they were struggling with wear. 
and then to put mediums back on Leclerc at the safety car, not to call Sainz in, who left it up to his engineer. And then they made no, no progress from there. I mean, Sainz just got intimidated all over the place. That's why he lost so many positions so quickly. He was, bless his little heart, he was just so intimidated by everybody. I feel a bit sorry for him in that sense. Um, but ninth and 10th for Ferrari when they started fourth and fifth on the grid, that is, you know, the the, the level of Ferrari mess ups that is, you know, it's right up there, really, because they should have been coming away with some serious points, but they have lost a lot of points to Mercedes today. They are almost 50 points adrift of them now. And even Aston Martin, who didn't really have that good a weekend, have pulled away that <laughs> I mean we've seen it all before with Ferrari it's just one calamity after another so uh, give it two weeks Budapest and uh, they'll do it all again yeah we really could have seen a Ferrari challenge for the podium today and we just didn't even see that um but Warren I'm coming back to you then for Fernando Alonso in the Aston Martin uh already mentioned his teammate earlier what was it about Silverson that's pegged Aston Martin back this weekend because even with Fernando in that car they've struggled and been off the pace all weekend yeah I don't know maybe all other teams are just catching up to him they had such a great developed car at the beginning and now you're seeing McLaren how well they've developed the car the last couple of weeks I think that's probably it they were probably outperforming with the other cars at the beginning and other teams maybe got it wrong at the beginning and now you're seeing a little bit of regression back to the mean as 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 you might say and i mean look he's he's still made up a couple spots out there he did a good job defending at the end to hold on to what he finished in six i think or seventh um and he had a he had a a solid race look i think he's going to be pretty disappointed i still go back to him saying i know this is you have to be confident in yourself but saying hey i'm i'm going to be on the podium the rest of the season whenever he forgot to get it and like that's a ridiculous comment to make i don't think anybody truly believes it but when you kind of set yourself up for that and you have a weekend like this you're kind of like like i think it it is more glaring on on the car and brings more spotlight to a person like Fernando who probably doesn't want he who likes to spotlight, but it's still like, let's maybe re- have realistic expectations and, and other teams are now getting better and you got off to a great start and, 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 and that, but it was, again, I think a weekend, a quiet weekend, something that they're really not going to do that. And I think they might have to be worried going forward that, I mean, we saw the McLaren t- today, maybe they're going to get bumped back a spot. I think this is quite, quite worrying for them. Yeah, definitely. It was certainly a sort of fourth, fifth best like team sort of That's performance this weekend. Um, yeah. McLaren have definitely made a jump and we will get on to the McLarens, you know, um, with such a great performance from them. But Phil, P15 to P6 for Red Bull's number two driver. Sergio Perez was out in Q1 yesterday, recovered to the top six today, but he's now 99 points behind his teammate and only 19 ahead of Fernando Alonso. We've spoken about Checo's underperformance, but it's looking really feasible that he loses P2 in the championship unless things can be turned around, isn't it? Uh, Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to happen. The whether it's going to be Fred or it's going to be Lewis is the question. Uh, I mean, if Aston Martin has these issues on the medium to high speed type of tracks, then it's probably not a great, it's not going to be a good sign. But then the Mercedes doesn't have grip in high speed corners in the rear and has the draggiest car on the grid. Basically, that isn't a, that is in the higher uh, tier. So, I mean, this could go all the way down to the end of the season, really. Um, Checo's qualifying has been uh, abysmal here recently, but I mean, I think it's, I mean, I, I'm not going to go off on my one of my rants or tangents about how Red Bull does things, but uh, it's convenient how one car, albeit with a guy that's a going to get another world championship and get past 50 wins and all that his car works perfectly fine but then when Checo needs something or something's not working oh it's not it's not the car it's you um I mean he was winning races a few months ago so I don't know what happened uh somebody went and put a 
juju got some weird juju going on on the other car put some curse or hex on it need to call joe boo out from major league to go and 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 get some whiskey and rum and maybe go and you know bless the thing i don't know they, they're gonna have to do something for him because it's pretty ugly uh on that side of the garage um if it was you know just straight up he should have bp2 this should not be a discussion but obviously it's Red Bull, so it can never be straightforward. And Checo's now the latest person that's getting run through the buzzsaw that is being a Red Bull number two driver. We need an old Priestley and a young Priestley. Um, but fr- moving on from that terrible pun, um, when this race started, we were told the softs would do 10 laps and that would be it. When George Russell bucks for mediums from his 30-lap used softs, everything was looking promising for the Brit, uh, who had been going nicely in P4 before the safety car. Aaron, did the safety car cost Russell a podium today? And what did you think of his performance? Uh, No, it didn't cost him a podium today because he didn't undercut Piastri. So he'd have ended up behind Piastri after the safety car, well, without the safety car anyway. Um, But... We'll, we'll, obviously, we'll get on to Lewis Hamilton later, but the safety car actually benefited Mercedes as a team because it allowed Hamilton to get ahead of Piastri, which ordinarily wouldn't have been possible. And then we also saw that the Mercedes wasn't quick enough to pass the McLaren in a straight fight, even with DRS. So for all of George's good work in the opening stint, the, the safety car did undermine it somewhat, but he didn't lose out. I mean, he didn't gain, which is what he was hoping to do. But he ended up where he was anyway. The only driver he lost out to was his teammate, which, okay, that's annoying for him because he wanted to be the driver on the podium. It would have been great for George to have his first uh, British Grand Prix podium. But for the team, it it worked out really well because they got a car on the podium and George didn't lose out. They they weren't, weren't any worse off with one car. So for Russell, a solid weekend. Obviously, he out-qualified Hamilton, which... I always think is a really good barometer of how good a driver is in terms of their qualifying pace. I don't think this car is a qualifying car for Mercedes. So Lewis isn't able to exploit it to its true potential, but you see it come to the fore in the race. And that's why George was able to be so good in that opening stint and challenge the Ferrari. You've got two cars that do completely opposite things to the tires. The Ferrari eats them like they're going out of fashion. And the Mercedes is so kind to the tyres that they, they're they so willing to go with them for a long time. They they love a road trip with the Mercedes, don't they, these Pirelli tyres? So that's where you saw the difference and the benefit for Mercedes. And look at the, the tangle that uh, Ferrari got themselves into. Mercedes, because they were able to look after the tyres, were able to do something straightforward with their strategy and really get the most out of their car. So... For Russell, as I said, solid weekend, good points. Uh, but, you know, it could have been a little bit better, but only one position, I think. Yes, a valid um, representation of George Russell's race today. Warren, Oscar Piastri was one second away from his first ever F1 podium, which to say the McLarens had not run a whole lap in the top five all season before Austria is pretty darn impressive. Um, he could have been P2 before the end of lap one, but still a very, very good job from him with his career best finish, wouldn't you say? Oh, for sure. And I think he he was the one, he was the unlucky one with the safety car. He probably had, he had third place locked up if that wasn't going to happen, how, every, how the pit stops were going to go. He was the one that got unlucky on that. And going back to the start, he he was wheel to wheel with Max before they go into that first little turn right there. And he, I, Max just got it. He had a little more courage, I would say, which is hard. I'm, I'm, that's not an indictment on Piastri because I think this weekend you saw like how talented he is and everyone's talked about him being a potential world champion, which I think sometimes you throw that, people throw that out a little lightly, just calling someone, hey, he could win some world championships. But like you could really see how talented Piastri was this weekend and today with the qualifying yesterday, then today in the race and how he just went, he, 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 he kept um, Russell behind him at the end. I thought when they said Lewis's tires were, were were going that maybe he could give a little extra. 
maybe a fight for third there, but I, I they probably just were like, hey, protect fourth if you can do it. Um, not also, I think you talked about the um split strategy of Ferrari. I was surprised that the McLarens didn't split it up one on the hards, one on the softs, too. I thought it was a uh, they even had Zach Brown on saying, Yeah, we're a little worried that they're both on hards. Like you could tell he was pretty nervous about that. It worked out well in the end for at least for Lando, but I thought that that's another time. Hey, split the strategy, see if something's working, but he didn't lose a spot. I don't know if he was going to pass Lewis on the softs if he got him, but I think it might be worth a shot for, for, for Piastri like that. But all in all, I thought it was a fantastic weekend for, for him and shows really how talented he is and, and how, how future is future uh, is bright for him. And I'm excited to watch him uh, going forward the rest of the year and forward. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, certainly, you know, a driver who is an exciting talent. Uh, I believe the reason as to why McLaren decided to stay with the hard tires after starting on the mediums was because they were worried about tire deg, which has been their downfall over the season. Um, and if you're going to go for a tire that's, uh, you know, not going to worry about deg, I guess that's the hard tires, but they were still quick on them anyway. And, you know, did yeah. manage to bag uh, P2 and P4. But in between the McLarens then, um, the bread of the McLaren, of the Lewis Hamilton sandwich, Phil, uh, the safety car put him in contention um, and brilliant racing from him, him and Lando Norris saw the Mercedes driver duking it out, resulting in his 14th podium at this circuit. Great performance despite being off the track at turn three on lap one. Yeah, it wasn't an ideal start for for uh lewis there and uh but he made up for it it's it's home it's his house he has a straight named after him and it doesn't have the car that he's had in other times but he wakes up silverstone just brings out something out of lewis a couple tents extra um, he did spin out in qualifying yesterday as well so it wasn't a clean weekend by any stretch of the imagination but he came through in the clutch, was able to um, ca capitalize on the VSC and then the full safety car uh, to get his pit stop. And, um, you know, the, the used softs were good for a while, but I think his, you know, his battle with Lando, which was a great battle, uh, was the downfall of it because he wanted to get that P2 so bad that he killed the tires and uh, he had nothing left. Uh, I mean, if you let it go another lap or if there was, it was a 54, 55 lap race, he was going to finish third or fourth in that race because of how fast Piastri was coming up to him. But um, in a, in a with all the stuff that's been going on with this team and this car for the last year, 18 months, whatever, uh, getting in podium – at home, going to one of his best racetracks in Hungary here in a couple of weeks' time, and uh, you know, I mean, he's not. I mean, obviously not going to win, but you know, possibilities of another podium, top five. His battle for second in the world championship is definitely on, and um, he can continue doing this sort of uh, productivity. It'd be great. It'll make the races a little more watchable. <laughs> Yeah, there is certainly something to be said about a good performance at Silverstone from Lewis Hamilton. But folks, we've got to give it up for Lando Norris. P1 by the first corner after a great start. He lost the lead to Verstappen whilst recharging going into Brooklyn's, and it all looked to have been put on the line when he was on the hards towards the end. But Aaron, the chrome in that McLaren livery must be giving them some kind of aerodynamic performance. Stunning display from Lando Norris today. It was brilliant. I mean... I was thinking ahead of the race how great it would be not just to see Lando take the lead at turn one, but for the roar of the crowd. And I thought it's just going to be spine tingling. And my word, it was. I mean, it's going to sound completely biased, and it is, but Silverstone is the best. It really is. You get fabulous racing because the, the corners lead into each other. You can be on the right line for one, so say like Brooklyn's, then Luffield, you're on the wrong line and then you can get the inside for Cops. There's a straight and then you can do it all again through Stowe and Vale and Club. So it's just a brilliant circuit for, for racing. The atmosphere is fantastic. At no other circuit do you really hear the crowd cheering like that. 
I don't know whether it's just the way the microphones are positioned or where the stands are, but it's just, it's always brilliant. It's, it's always such a great atmosphere. And that cheer when Lando took the lead, I mean, I was part of it in my living room. So it was great fun to have a hundred odd thousand people on the TV joining me. So what a wonderful moment. That That's the moment, they're the sort of moments we, we want to see as racing fans. That sort of surprise moment. He could have taken the lead. He could have just backed out and, and not taken the lead. But a bit like when Ricardo took the lead in, in Monza in 2021, it set up his race for a great result. Okay, he didn't get the win. Never likely to, really. Um, I was a bit disappointed that he didn't make more of a fist of it against Verstappen when that, that attack came, because I thought that would have been quite fun and really make Max work for it. But he, he took the sensible approach. His team radio was really assured that maturity is there. And anyone who doubted that Lando Norris isn't, and I know this phrase has already come up and it, it does get thrown around, but if, he, if anyone doubted that he's world championship quality, they can take that and put it in the bin now because he has shown, if he hasn't already, he is absolutely ready to win a world championship. And if you put him in that Red Bull alongside Verstappen, we have one heck of a season because you put him in there, he probably wins races immediately. And if he qualifies 15th, he's coming through for the podium, I think. He's that good. He is so, so impressive. And the way he dealt with the pressure of Hamilton, and Andrea Stella was saying on Channel 4 after the race, the hards were a risk because of the warm-up at the restart. But once you got to turn nine, which is Cops Corner, they would start giving you grip. You had to survive the first few corners. And fortunately for McLaren, the Mercedes runs with a parachute on the back of it down the straights. So they were able to get away with it. And then the speed and the quality of the upgraded McLaren came into fruition. A brilliant drive from Lando. So good to see him back on the podium, a big smile on his face. He got the cheers of the crowd. And, you know, I know it's not the win, but obviously he had that Sochi 2021 still hanging over him. Great to see him having a positive experience at the front of a race again. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, nearly 500,000 people in attendance at Silverstone over the weekend. The two loudest cheers we heard all weekend was when he put it on provisional pole and when he took the lead into turn one. Um, but Warren, to come to our race leader, then Max Verstappen reported that the wind was making the car difficult to drive. The softs were not the most comfortable of tyres towards the end of the race, but he brought it home with the fastest lap and marches towards that inevitable third consecutive driver's title. Anything to add? Well, he made it a little more interesting at the beginning with the start. I, I, I was, if you go back and look at Max over probably the last, I would think, four or five years that red bull doesn't get the most consistent starts if you go back and probably watch most of them i think you it, he struggles with the start sometimes and it happened today and they like, even joked like hey it made it a little more fun for me to get an overtake for the lead and look i would have liked to see lando try but i get why he wasn't gonna do that it didn't really make sense for him i was when he got past at the first turn i was wondering how many laps would it take for him to pass uh lando and i thought that was a fun game to play and i will say i think five i don't know what i was really thinking but five seemed at the time a little long like i thought he might get him in like the third lap so i was like all right this is this is pretty impressive but no i think it's another ho-hum performance by max there's really nothing more i think you can say it's not um he he got the job done every every time he needed to he made it a little more inter- interesting for us. I, so I appreciate that. If he can give us starts like that every single week, sign me up for that. And then we can get like, that's what he should do. They need to make the starts bad in the, in the spirit of making it entertaining for, for people, bad starts, get, get past at the first corner and then have to be in second for whatever five laps and see what happens. But now I say that jokes and he's still probably going to win anyways. Um, but no, it was, it was a, it was a good race for him. Yeah, and it was also a good restart from Max. He yes. did take Lando by surprise and was yeah. basically, I think, at least a second ahead of him by the time um, the next lap was finished. But um, that's obviously where everyone finished. The official Grid Talk drive, the, the, uh, driver of the day <laughs> went to Lando Norris. Um, but Phil, who was your driver of the day? 
It has to go to Lando. I mean, I did initially pick Burn Maylander because that made the race more interesting, but that wasn't entirely due to him. It was because he had to do his job. Um, Lando had one of the best weekends of his career, and he did it at home. Uh, Zach Brown, for once, doesn't look like a fool um, with how good the McLaren car has come out here in recent weeks. So uh, great job by Lando. Let's see if he can uh, match that intensity and pace at Hungary, a track that McLaren has had great success at over the years in the past. So um, credit to him on that. Absolutely. And Aaron, your driver of the day? Uh, well, I did vote for Lando in the Grid Talk poll in our Slack, but I'm actually going to give a mention to the other McLaren driver, Oscar Piastri. It's not often that we see a rookie perform so well in qualifying. You think the performances that Lewis Hamilton put in in his rookie season with McLaren. And Piastri's qualifying performance was the best since 2013 when Bottas uh, stuck it in P3 in Canada. But for Bottas that, that day, he just went backwards. Piastri was at the sharp end and was almost running second place. It was just, you know, he was superb today. Okay, he didn't get the podium, but there'll be plenty more days where he can challenge for a podium and maybe even a win. And Warren, your driver of the day, was it Lando? Uh, I forgot to vote in the poll, but yeah, it was Lando. I think he is clear. He was the clear voter or driver of the day. Absolutely. So now, obviously, it's time to give our panelists an opportunity to plug something. Phil, Grip Strip Podcast, where can people find it? Uh, thanks, Ruby, as always. Um, you can find the Grip Strip Podcast basically anywhere. Uh, you listen to podcasts, you can find it at philipgmatthew.com, which is my blog site. You can also find it on YouTube, Grip Strip Podcast, where Josh, I'll find my co-host, goes and posts the uh, video feeds. And at Gripstrip Pod on Twitter, 175 plus episodes in. And um, as I always like to say, if it goes fast, we usually talk about it on the Gripstrip Podcast. We'll definitely be talking about the British Grand Prix. Uh, might actually have to amend our uh, F1 segment uh, because it was actually a really interesting race. So we might have to spend a couple more minutes this week on it. So, um, yeah, well, uh, you can find me at PG Matthew 28 or Phil on Twitter at Phil G Matthew 28 on Instagram. And, um, as always great work, Ruby and Aiden and glad to be on with Warren and Aaron and, uh, always love being a part of the grid talk crew. Thanks, Phil, Aaron, where can people find the AHGP? Uh, well, I echo Phil's, uh, thanks to having me on. Um, you can find AHGP uh, on YouTube. It's a mishmash now of my predictions, which uh, I, I, always, I generally predict five things that will definitely happen at each Grand Prix. And uh, all five of them happened uh, this weekend at Silverstone, which we were going through pre-show. So you can find like various shorts, uh, longer form videos, predictions, uh, recaps on races, a little bit of F123 content. Uh, I may or may not have started a co-op career with someone on this this show today. Um, and we had round one and I ended up not doing very well. Um, so we're taking on a wheel versus a pad. And uh, I'm taking on Ruby, who is on a wheel. So there's a mishmash of lots of different things. So if you're into a little bit of gaming, there's something there for you. Something for everyone there. And you can also find me on, uh, not on Twitter, because it's dead now. Uh, you can find me on threads, Aaron Harper 22. But if you still use Twitter, it's AHGP pod. Yeah, and Warren, obviously, Paddock Pals, is, where can people find that? And is there anything else you'd like to plug? Yeah, they can find us wherever you listen to your podcast, Spotify, Apple. My cousin and I will be doing race recap later, probably in an hour or so after this. You can find out what other drivers we think are comedy drivers. We got Lance Stroll that we can add. We'll, we'll, we'll go down the list. Um, you can f and also one of our segments is the, forgot that you existed. I've mentioned it before, but what driver the broadcast doesn't show at all that you forget was actually racing today. Um, we're on, we did just join threads. We're on that and Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. We're on all. We're on all the socials um, at Paddock Pell's podcast. 
Yeah, and if anyone wants to find anything more from me, um, you can find me on the socials at Rubes or Rubes001 um, for Instagram and uh, Threads, considering someone beat me to it. Um, and annoyingly, Threads obviously keeps the same username, so I didn't get a chance to try and supersede anyone um, and be the Rubes of Threads. But Grid Talk is available on YouTube, where most episodes are recorded live, and we'll also be doing a little bit of a post show, just answer some questions from the chat, and also any sort of things that we missed during the show, um, particularly Aaron's Hass Ferrari links question. Um, but it's also available on Amazon Fire, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Music, Verbal and Pocket Casts. Just search Formula on Grid Talk for our huge back catalogue of shows with previews and reactions to the qualifying and the race results. Please consider supporting the channel on Patreon so we can get mics, lights and better recording equipment. And also make sure you subscribe so you're the first to know when each new episode is released. We'll be back soon with plenty more F1 content. Thank you very much for listening to the Grid Talk podcast presented by Bet Online. and goodbye. So to kick off the post show then, Aaron, you obviously brought up the question during the show, but um, Phil, you said that you had something to say about this, like basically straight away. Are Haas's links to Ferrari b- causing more trouble than they're worth, basically? I don't believe so. I think they are a rudderless ship of an organization. And I forget who said it in the media, probably that, more on uh, who runs Ferrari, but um, he who blocked Andretti from getting an F1 with Sauber. Um, there it was him, or I think and Toto or something. They said, Go and buy a team. Well, there you go. Let Michael Andretti, who wants to actually be an F1, actually wants to bring an American driver to F1 and make progress by Haas. You'd already that would be an immediate improvement right then and there. Um, the Ferrari linkups, yeah, the power units are not great, uh, but I also don't think that they have a real. It, I, I don't know what their plan is. Every year it's like, oh, we make a development, we go and develop our car for like two minutes, and then like, okay, we give up, and then it's like, oh, we'll just drive around, and oh, Nico Hulkenberg is the new flavor of the day, and he qualifies top ten, and then he drops like an anchor. And then you have Kevin Magnuson bringing out yellows. I mean that that I mean it's, it's a joke. And the only reason that anybody thinks of them as relevant is because Gunther Steiner curses a lot. I mean, really, is there any other relevant point to Haas F1? No. There. I mean, I I have a bigger beef because of my NASCAR fandom, but then that I can't blame just Gene Haas. For that, I have to blame one of my racing heroes for that too. So, um, but yeah, they don't have they don't have a direction. There's no there's no movement that's going to say that they're going to ever be a contender. Um, which to me, why are you going to spend that much money to just run run mediocre? He could have run an IndyCar team and ran a four car IndyCar team for like a quarter of the price. <laughs> and actually have a chance to compete uh and yeah but it's gene haas for you is his great way of running motorsports teams has shown over the years to be quite amazing so um comes through in the clutch as always yeah it is something to be said considering when haas obviously joined f1 um their model of you know buying ferrari parts and basing a lot of their you know practice off ferrari like that was praised because it allowed them to enter the sport and be competitive unlike you know the more recent new teams that we've seen from you know like um virgin and uh i can't remember hrt and hrt caterham lotus whichever um but by sticking with ferrari and obviously gunter steiner's still in charge of that team that just haven't performed well at all generally for many years you know like that's another thing i think needs to be thrown into this scenario um aaron warren anything either of you would like to throw up to this obviously aaron you put the question to us <laughs> go on warren you, you go first i i know i think i came on here a couple of times and i said like what's the point of gunther he's he makes like what what phillips like he just makes jokes and oh, like he should have he should have been gone he should have been gone a long time ago there's been no development 
Um, and so I don't get why they're like Gene's collecting a check, but it's an expensive check to write and like an expensive thing to make money in. And that it doesn't seem he's just in it to be in it. I think, no, I, I agree. I don't, I don't really get where they're going at. And the whole, like, they don't really have a lot of American support. They, all the Americans, like everybody else, if you want to be the American team there, it's time. The, the strike while the iron's hot. We all know how, how much, um, that funds growing in America. You can just look at myself in a, as an example, but this is the time to get behind. Hey, we have an American owned team. He doesn't do anything to, to, to help American fans get to him. And that's what they should have done. And, and no one, no one cares about us here. It's, it's kind of sad. And I'm, I'm saying an, Amer- an American driver could help, but there's other things that you could go on. It's just, it just doesn't seem like they're capitalizing on things that they could capitalize on. And then when it gets to the racetrack, they just, they're bad. And, and that's, they're just, they're just toiling down there. I, I, I think we keep talking about the same things. Would you say McLaren are bigger in America than Haas? Simply 100%. Because, 100%. Because they've got the, the IndyCar involvement as well. And obviously, Haas have the NASCAR involvement, but yeah, they've got Pato Award in the McLaren t- uh, group. And, you know, obviously, Lando and Oscar are very marketable as well. As well. And obviously, Zach Brown is an American. He, he's done a lot of work yes. getting sponsors in. So Haas have completely missed a trick there, haven't they? Yeah. So when I went to the race in Austin in 2021, like obviously the teams you saw the most were Red Bull, McLaren, Ferrari, Mercedes, and then Ferrari. Like those four, obviously, you're going to expect that. You saw a decent amount of Aston Martin stuff because Seb was still with them. So people were supporting him. I think I saw maybe two Haas hats and I was there on Saturday and Sunday the whole day. Like we saw nothing of Haas. And that's the thing. And it's, this is your home race. You could have done some promotion stuff and you did nothing in there and you're just way behind. It's, it's, that's what it is. No, it's to your point too. They just don't do a good job of marketing yeah. themselves. Like. They, and it's been a problem ever since. I mean, echoing Warren's thoughts. I mean, it's been a problem from the beginning. Uh, Gunther has been against American drivers. I mean, I get the European bias. No offense to you guys. I mean, but it's like, the fact of the matter is it's like it's at this point, I mean, it's it's misplaced in in a lot of ways. I mean, I think the fact that Williams Williams now that they're on the upswing. So you want to root for the underdog, number one, number two, Alex Albon speaks perfect English. So that's better than a lot of people around here anyway. And and he's like Thai and he's anything British. So then that makes him cool and he colors his hair and stuff. So then they think he's cool and he's interesting and he's funny. And then you have Logan, who's kind of just like, you know, the guy and he's getting in there and trying to figure things out. He's a, just a quiet, you know, very, very even keel dude, but he's the first American representation in formula one in a full-time setting since Scott speed. And that's 17 years ago. I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. I mean, we've had more Indian drivers on the grid and I'm as an Indian guy, I'm happy, but, you know, it's like more Indian drivers on the grid in the last 17 years than American drivers. We had one part-time driver that now is an Indy car driver for McLaren. Um, it's, I mean, McLaren's name, I think, if you go back to what you were saying, Aaron, McLaren's name was popular because of Senna. Um, Senna and, you know, he had that reached, uh, that reaches the world. And, and, I mean, that's why a lot of people connected with McLaren, but... It's like Haas has never had any redeeming qualities. They have a bland paint scheme. They have a bland car. They're poorly run. And and it's like they don't have a direction. And it's like, why are you in F1? If you don't have a direction, you can run, you can run like crap in other series and pay way less money. But I guess, I guess Gene Haas is, wants to wash his money somehow, some way. So just like the Saudis. So he washes it by running in the back in F1. For me, um, like the best uh, Haas livery was obviously their 2017, I think, it or 2019 livery, the black and gold one. But obviously, mm-hmm. with that being tied to rich energy, you know, that was never going to stick around. But um, to follow this conversation up with a comment that we've had in our live chat from Buttercream Fiend, um, 
Do you think McLaren could have had a double podium if they had let Piastri push Lando? Let's make this the last um, topic of the post show, um, and I'll open it out to the floor. Uh, no. So, I I don't th- I don't think they should have let Piastri race Lando. There was nothing to gain because if they'd done that, they would have they would have just chewed up their tires. So having Oscar just sort of track Lando. I can't remember who said it. Uh, it might have been Alex Brundle on, on like Formula 2 commentary. Like you, When you're following another car, you'll learn stuff. You'll see how they're positioning their car, like the way they're picking up the traction. And you won't see everything, but you'll learn a lot about tr- like car positioning and, and stuff like that. So I think in, in some ways, it was actually a really good learning opportunity for, for Oscar to be running at the front and following Lando in a car that's performing well. And yeah, they got unlucky with the, with the safety car. That's the big thing that cost them the double podium. Hamilton coming through on softs towards the end, or if maybe Mercedes would have put the hards on, who knows? Um, yeah, may, maybe. But I think without the safety car, they're in a much, much stronger position. That said, I mean, Piastri was only a second off of a, a podium. So uh not not too bad, was it? I mean, if you'd offered McLaren second and fourth going in on Friday morning, they would have snapped both your arms off for it. Yeah, I'd certainly agree. Anything to add, Warren or Phil? No, I mean, I talked about Piastri during the main. I just thought he got unlucky by the safety car. That's why I didn't get the podium. Yeah, that the safety car certainly um, hurt them as a uh, team. But... Um, I'll go on, Phil. Yeah, I'll just say that for a rookie, um, I mean, he doesn't today. I mean, it's very rare. I, I, I don't know which, I think, Warren, you mentioned it with Lewis. We don't get this very often where a rookie in F1 runs up front, handles himself well, and it looks the part. Now, granted, we've been hearing about Oscar Piastri for years and years. He's the next big thing and all this stuff. Today was proof positive of that. Um, McLaren managed it as best they could. It didn't work out because of Magnussen breaking down, but it doesn't mean that he's not going to get there eventually. I think it's a matter of time for him. And he's a very, and, and it's, I would argue, the most complete driver pairing on the grid because they literally are so young that they're going to push each other. They're both hungry. They know that they, they have the same goal in mind. And of course, Lando, of course he's besties with Max. So he's probably going to end up in that death hole. That is a second car at Red Bull. But, um, Piastri is such a talent, you know, for Australia, they haven't had a world champion since Alan Jones. It would be huge for them. Uh, and, um, they're they're a great driver pairing and it, and it's something to look at as the years go on how these guys grow as a team and if it gets a little more intense between the two of them. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it was mentioned on yesterday's show um Alpine have fully just lost a driver for the future. Um but you know, that's what happens when you don't give your drivers or prospective drivers the respect that they are deserved. And, you know, if you're not going to give them a contract, don't keep messing them around with it. But on that note, let's call it a show there. Thank you very much to everyone who joined in. Thank you very much to the three of you and Aiden, of course, for being present for the show and, you know, bringing some great points and some great post-show talking points as well. Um, like I say, we'll be back soon to preview. I think it's Hungary next. Um, so, you know, we'll be back, I think, maybe next weekend, I think it is, um, to preview that. But in the meantime, let's hope that the classification doesn't change again post-race. <laughs> um, otherwise, we might have to record another show tomorrow. But thank you very much, Aaron, Warren, Phil, Aiden, everyone around for joining. And we'll see you next time.